So welcome to Foster Control 3D. I'm Kevin. Uh, we're going to be here for the next uh, few months and learning a lot of interesting things. So today's class is really just an administrative overview. We're going to look at what 3D4 is about, why it's important, but also we're going to show how it fits into the rest of chemical engineering. So you have to understand that the courses we take at the university are not independent of each other, they all tie in very nicely, and we plan a very specific procedure for to move through the system, and so I'm going to explain a bit about why it's So, we can pull here, um, as I said, we'll start with some background. Let's talk about myself quick. Um, many of you in the class kind of know me from some of the courses. Uh, so, I came to Canada in 2000 after finishing up the science at the University of Cape Town, I did my master's here at MAG. Um, interestingly, Dr. Clark was working for me for the school for the So, um, and then I did my master's here with him in 2002. And then I worked on a number of projects with this company, data analysis, a lot of process control was also involved in that. Um, and then just before coming to MAG full time in 2012, I worked at Blacks as a client on the company for one year. So, about 10 years of working outside the university and then now I'm back here. Let's uh, quickly talk about how you can get hold of me if you need to speak with me. Um, my calendar is online so you can see when I'm available and when I'm busy. You can um, then come visit me in my office at DSP, not in JHE, in DSP in the basement level. Um, but please set up an appointment with me by email first. So I can plan my day and uh, plan my meeting with you. Um, and then if you need to get hold of me, there's my appointment. So this course that we're going to look at is not my work. So I'm filling in Dr. Schwartz, who normally teaches this course, he's on sabbatical this year. Um, but I'm also drawing on a lot of his material that Dr. Marlin as well, who took the course before Chris. So Dr. Marlin retired from the university about five years ago now. Um, we will in fact be using his textbook here in this course. Um, I'll be using some of his notes. But the reason why I've chosen to do that is Dr. Marlin has a tremendous amount of experience. Right? He's worked in Exxon Mobil for many years. He's taught industrial process control at over 40 different companies. So like, this is not university level. This is for people that are working in industry and need to apply process control. So he's taught about 40 different courses, and his textbook and his notes are built up from that material. So that's one reason why I, I want to use his book and I highly recommend you to use it as well. Um, also some of the other sources of material that I draw from uh, my own experience, but then uh, some of the work I work with for the McMaster Advantage Consortium is a different company that sponsor the research of a number of our graduate students here at the university. Um, and we work a lot with those companies and sometimes of course the issues that come up in those discussions. Okay, so let's just talk a bit about administrative issues, get that out of the way. I'd like to introduce uh, our TAs. So, um, this year, including the council's right to the library is not there yet. So, we have three really, really good TAs. They're all cost control um, students. So, Julian over here is doing his master's with Prashant. He's a JHE 132, and there's his extension number. Zamri is a JHE 369, I think, if I got the information correct. Um, and he's doing his PhD with Dr. Schwartz. And then Rudis here over here has just uh, started his PhD and done his comprehensive exam last December, and moving on to finishing up his PhD over the next two, three years. And he's with both Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Machel. Okay, so three really top-notch uh, master's and PhD students that I got for this course to help you guys out. Okay, so there we go, first line. Oh, here's Zamri, perfect line. Okay, so Zamri, Kudin, and Lucas here are here to help you guys get to the bottom of any of the problems that you experience, and you'll be seeing them in all the tutorials, and uh, I, I'm expecting you guys to work with them to get your questions answered. So the way we, we're working our courses now is we don't have office hours. Right? We find that no one shows up for office hours, so that's a waste of everyone's time. So what we do is we say, email the TAs, make an appointment, 
right? Because all of you are on different schedules, so there's no point in having office hours because no time works for everyone. So when you've got a gap in your agenda, you can email one of the TAs and they can meet with you as well. So that's how office hours work. And if the TAs aren't available, I'm always available. Thanks guys, uh, you can stay or leave. Now, the most important point of contact this course is our website. So the website is over there, there's the URL for it. Many of you might have seen it already and visited it. All the information for this course is over there, all the slides. Right, so including these slides that you're looking at now, they've been posted there since last week. So I'll post them before the class and expect you to print them out and bring them along. Now not every class will have slides. A lot of the classes will just be on the board. But when I do have slides, they will be available over there for you to print out before the time and bring them to the class. I'll post all the assignments and solutions to the assignments over there. The tutorials will be posted over there. Um, and all the announcements that I make will be posted. So there's nothing on Avenue on this, on this course. The only thing that's in Avenue in this course is your grades. Everything else is on the Learn Solution that my class is here. So if you go and look at that website, uh, let's see, it's not going to look the best here on this screen. Oh, no, I don't have it here open. Um, so just go take a look at it. Uh, later on today, and you'll see all the announcements are up there on the website. So that's where I'll be posting them. There'll be a date, and I'll make the announcement so that you know how to do The other thing that you can do to keep up to date is follow the Twitter account for this course, you can control control. So anytime I make an announcement, I also tweet it out, and that way um, you don't have to go check it. Uh, so a lot of students will sign up for that in most of my other courses. Uh, so please, if you, if you have that and use Twitter, follow the 3 d 4 control account so that you get information. So whenever I post grades, I, I think about it and I do assignments or Any questions on this? is I'll post the video and audio of this class. I recorded at the back of it. There's the camera and there's an the audio recording as well. And most of the students uh, in the reviews say they find it very useful um, if they, um, they, like you sit in the class and I, I cannot keep my concentration going for 45 minutes, right? So sometime in the class your mind is going to go somewhere else and you missed something. So you can go back to the video and review it. The sound quality and audio quality uh, and video quality are always the best. So it's not recommended as a tool to miss classes and you can catch up that way. If you use it for that, that's, that's your own choice. But it's usually um, the best, as, and most people say they get the most value of it as just a review of some five, 10 minutes of the class that they missed out or you might understand or you just want to hear it a second time to make sure you got it right. So, as long as it's possible, I'll record it. Some days I might forget my camera or uh, it's broken in the past before, so it may not, there's no guarantee that this video is there. So that's, that's what that is. It's the disclaimer. It's not always going to be there necessarily, but I'll try my best to make sure it is. Okay, let's talk about the textbooks and all the money you're going to have to spend on this guy. So I have some tough decision, right, to prescribe textbooks for courses. My preference for most of my classes is not to prescribe textbooks. Uh, but this course, I am prescribing this textbook by Dr. Marlin. So it's the second edition. I believe it's around $140 at the bookstore. So it's a bit of a pricey one. So if you go but get it at the bookstore, it looks like this. Soft cover with the black and green and the orange on it. So it's uh, there's only 17 copies available. For some reason, the bookstore didn't order enough. So there's this one available, the books that you buy at you. If you buy it second hand online, and probably a whole lot cheaper, the cover will look like that. Okay, so if you get it from second hand from a bookstore, if you get it new from Amazon, I think it's a hundred dollars. Okay, so it's, the bookstore is, uh, uh, the publisher of the textbook made a $20 discount on the book for the soft cover. Um, this 
for this course, right, that they only sent us 20 copies. Three of them have already been sold. But if you can get it online, uh, get this one. Now, the way I use the textbook is the following. I, I'm never going to expect you to bring it to class. This is a heavy thing. I'm going to carry this around all day. But, and I won't expect it either in, um, in tutorials, right? But it will be useful in tutorials. Let's put it that way. And when I post assignment questions, I'm not going to say, look at problem 3.4. I will actually give you the problem okay, in, the, in the PDF for the assignment tutorial. So you can get by without the textbook, but bear in mind all the exams and all the midterms is open book. So you can either then choose to not have the textbook with you during the exams or midterms. That's decided what you are. So I'll leave it up to you to decide whether you should buy it or not. But let's put it this way. Dr. Marlon is the author of this book, and from what I was just saying to you earlier, this is a good book. It's going to be a valuable resource on your shelf for many years if you work in this area, okay? which many of you will. And many of you may not become process control experts, but any work that you do in the chemical industry will involve control loops and the problems with those control loops. So speak to anyone who's taken the fourth year course 4N, and everything that comes up, every comment that comes up in the evaluations is, I didn't realize how important process control it comes up in every part of our work. So this is a good book, lots of practical advice in it. So feel free to uh, make a decision with that advice. I'm going to ask, so I'm going to see, the bookstore told me that they only buy 20 because in the past it doesn't sell very well. Okay, so we'll see. Like if they sell out there, they order more. So they will get more. Okay, so let's, uh, another point on this course is anytime you want to send me some feedback, you can talk to me face to face, or you can talk uh, to me via email, or here's another option is fill out this form on the website and send me a message. It's entirely anonymous, so if you feel you want to say something and you don't want to reveal who you are, that's, that's okay. Your email address down there is optional. So that's one way to give me some feedback and tell me how things are going. I don't want to wait to the course evaluations in April. That's not going to do me any good. I'm not going to teach this course again next year. Right? So if you want to make improvements for this course right now, that's the way to do it, and I can get those improvements done by the way. Okay, so I'm going to ask there's also some software that we're going to be using in this course. So all of you have taken 3E, that's a prerequisite for this course, and you guys use MATLAB with Dr. Adams. And you wrote many routines there on integrating ODEs. That process control is a steady state dynamic behavior. So to do something by DT and integrating that over time is process control. Right? That's why 3E4 is such an important prerequisite for this course. And we're going to use those software that you wrote in this lab. Now you can also use Octave. I don't know if Tom uses Octave, but Octave is a replacement for MATLAB. So if you don't have MATLAB, you can download Octave for free, and it does exactly the same thing as MATLAB. The commands are exactly the same. So it's a free version of MATLAB. Pick either one, it will work just fine for this course. Okay, so MATLAB is our, it's going to be our software. It works on any computer. It's used in a variety of companies. That I've worked with almost every engineer and scientist that worked with knows of MATLAB or has used it. Um, and you guys have used it as well. Now. So you should be really good at, at that. So in tutorials and yeah, assignments, you'll need to use, use that periodically. So let's just understand why 3P4 is important from not just here at university, but when you graduate. You guys are going to be finishing up in a year and a half or so. From now I'm starting to look for jobs and working. This is why 3P4 is important. In, uh, so this is out of date, right? this is 12 years old, but the market for automation services is in the order of $44 billion in the process industry. And it's, at that time that that report was written, the expectation was a fair growth to 57 billion. So it's, it's, it's uh, probably a bit higher than that now. I don't have updated information. But what that doesn't capture, this is the cost of process control systems. What it doesn't capture is the cost of 
good process control engineers who know what they're doing. Now there's many companies in North America and internationally that their sole focus is process control. And there's several in Mississauga that do this. There's a, a whole bunch of companies in the United States where their only function is process control. So many of you could go from this once you graduate and make a career of this. See how interesting you find the next few months and you might decide that this is something that's worth doing. And I'll show you some examples of what process control engineers do in today's class as well as in the tutorials as well. So there's a good job prospect if you know what process control is about. But even if you never decide to become a process control engineer, and you simply remain in general chemical engineering or in any other area of engineering, you will face process control. And the reason is simple, is that none of our processes are ever at steady state. Now this might be a surprise to you, because all the way up to now, most of your courses have said, assume steady state, and then you go ahead and you calculate various things. But here I'm telling you that no process is ever at steady state. And that's absolutely true. Think of your, your home, or your, your apartment, or condo, or wherever you live. What does the temperature in that look like over time? If you have to pull up temperature in your room over time, what does it look like? Very little drop down, and then the surface will kick on, and then it'll back up. Okay, so we would like it to be at a comfortable 22, 23, whatever you, your preference is. Right? But we know that that's not true. But as Mark said here, it's going to hover around and then the furnace kicks in. And then there might be power failure. <laughs> we come back up again, right? So life is never at steady state. Actually, as I tell my statistics students in 4C, life would be pretty boring if things were at steady state. We would actually, none of us would have jobs. If things were at steady state, we'd just leave the things to go as is. Most of us wouldn't have employment. So life is never at steady state. Our systems are never at steady state. The environments around us are never at steady state. No process ever operates at steady state. So yes, in Dundas, is a picture of a wastewater clarifier. And the flow rate coming into this treatment, water treatment facility, as the typical sign of soil occur. So many of you that are in the bio area and are looking at wastewater treatment, that's a familiar um, curve to you. So peak flows at, at different times of the day, morning and, and evenings, with low depths in at midnight. So that's that variable flow coming into the, into the company's treatment system. Now they have to react to that. So what do they do? If this is your input coming into your process. We know that our processes don't like to be moved around. We like to keep our processes as close to steady state as possible. So what does this company do? What does any wastewater treatment plant do? It will pull back on the treatment at lower times in the day so that it keeps, keeps the process balanced. So pull back on the treatment flow rate. So they'll adjust their flow rates to compensate. So or whatever the, the treatment they use. Okay, so adjust their treatment process. Any other suggestions on how you might want to counteract that sort of input coming into your process? Okay, you have a large initial reservoir or something. Okay. A large initial reservoir. Absolutely. So any wastewater treatment company has a large hit vessel size over here. Where this wastewater flow of varying flow goes into that treatment vessel, and they rather let the vessel level go up and down, and then the flow rate out of the vessel is pretty constant. So the flow rate going into the rest of the process is constant. But this vessel, that, so if you draw a vessel up here in the front, the level in that vessel will be fluctuating. So that's one way to do it. Now obviously then there's design on how big should that vessel be. Right? And then, so there's some engineering work done over there to design the capacity for that vessel. 
And they'll design it for most treatment flows, right? But then when a storm comes, and then you get a high volume of wastewater coming in, because our sewer systems are not separated, wastewater and sewer and water overflow from the roads and snow melting, they often get combined. So when you get a big ice melt or a big rainstorm, there's this huge flow that comes in and then this vessel that you have up front that doesn't have the capacity. So then you open this valve and you send a higher flow rate to the rest of the process. So all of these things at times are changing. And the waste here coming in is not the same quality. Waste changes over time. So this process is experiencing variations. And so that's the key thing. This is why process control is so important. Because there's always variability. There's always a change in temperature, there's a change in input flows. None of this ever stays constant. Okay, so it's all varying, and that's why process control is there, is to try and counteract those changes. And one way that they'll do that is they'll have variable, variable air inputs here. So there's flow adjustments on that valve to adjust the amount of air coming in. How do we make those choices, right? There's not a person sitting there opening and closing that valve. Okay, there could be. There's no, nothing to say that it has to be computerized. It could be a person opening and closing this valve. But in general, we want these systems as automated as possible uh, because a computer can react much faster than a person. A person can sit there and get tired and become unresponsive. Computers, we like them because they can do a lot of redundant manual work. So we're going to learn how to design those computer algorithms. Okay. What is it that goes into that computer algorithm, and how do we tell that computer to open and close that valve to counteract what we call disturbances or changes? Here's another example. So in your courses up to now, now these codes are wrong. It's not 2E, it's uh, 2F. And in your heat transfer course, and your fluid flow course, and 3D thermo course, and now 3G that you're taking, you've learned many times how to work with flash vessels. You've got a flash, flash vessel here, and you've got methane, methane propane, so a variety of hydrocarbons coming in, and you want mostly methane, methane leaving out in your vapor phase, and in your liquid phase, your heavier components. So we've learned how to design that, and we've used vapor liquid equilibrium to, to determine the conditions in that flash vessel. But now you go ahead and you build that flash vessel. As is, on that diagram, which you've all seen up to now, so a simple flash vessel with our feet coming in, very straightforward. But if you go and build that plant, as is, so you go, go ahead and you use aspirin and you believe that you've done a great design that gets you exactly the amount of methane out of the top and the same and exactly the required propane, butane, and pentane at the bottom, if you go and build that unit, it won't work. Why is that? Has Dr. Adams been lying to you? Has Aspen lying to you? What's going to go wrong? It assumes steady state. It assumes steady state. Absolutely. Okay. So if it's not at steady state, what's varying? What's changing? that feed flow rate drops? So this, instead of being 100 moles per hour, it drops to 40 moles per hour. Your vapor liquid equilibrium is going to change. Mark says you get more vapor. So you have no liquid. This pump is going to run dry and you're going to break the pump. Right? So that pump that cost $20,000 is now broken. if you have no process control. Okay, so we need process control to protect our equipment. That's one, one reason why we do it. Because if we don't accommodate for this change in the feed, that guy is going to break. What else could go wrong? Over here? If you build it as is. But what if the composition changes up here? This composition changes, that vapor liquid equilibrium shifts. If 
something changes here in the temperature of the steam, that steam temperature increases, your temperature in that vessel could go beyond a safe operating point, and that vessel, that pressure vessel over here, for the uh, flash drum, could rupture and burst, okay, and cause an explosion and injure people. It could also then spew hydrocarbons and contaminants into the environment and into your neighbor's property. So process control has many objectives. We'll learn about them as we go through the course later this week, in fact. But many of them are related to safety of people, safety of the equipment, and good operation of the process. Much, much lower on the reason of why we apply process control is profitability and making money, okay? and good quality product. Our main reasons for process control are to protect the equipment, to protect ourselves, and to protect the environment. Okay? Not necessarily in that order of priority, but those are the three main reasons why we apply process control. So that flow sheet there that you've worked with so far in your prior courses now will actually look quite different. We'll have a whole lot of measurements, which we call sensors. We're measuring pressure, we're measuring temperature, we're measuring flows. And then we have a whole bunch of valves. So after this, and after fourth year, one thing you'll notice is that every flow sheet has a whole bunch of instrumentation, a whole bunch of valves and control loops. So that the equipment that you've learned how to design is one thing, but there's a whole lot more to it that you need to add to make this successful. Okay, so it's like driving a car or a bicycle. If you're driving a, a car or a bike, you've got one full, well actually you have two things that you can vary. You have your steering wheel, your position, you've also got your gas and your brake. Right? So you can vary your position on the road and you can vary your speed on the road. If those are, that would be the equivalent of these valves. So opening and closing your valves would be the equivalent of your steering wheel. We call that your final element. That's what's actually being changed. Okay. But you've also got your sensors. On a process, you measure your temperature, pressures, flows, levels, composition here, over here. You measure composition of the A. That's your sensor. If you're driving a car or a bike, your sensor is your eye. You're visually looking at where you are and the speed that you're going to make some sort of judgment. So your sensor is your eye. And your brain is the process control loop. You're making a calculation on what you see, and you're then adjusting that steering wheel or that gas pedal or that brake. So same idea is happening in a car as in a chemical process. So we need to, what we say, steer our process. We want to move our process and steer it to safe operating conditions and operating conditions that maximize our profit. Okay, and for stable operation. So we're going to learn what you do intuitively in the brain as you're driving your bike along. You do that so rapidly without even thinking about it. We're going to learn what, what that process is. Right? How do you go from measuring something on your sensor, so we take that as our input, here the person driving the car, that could be your eyes. How do you take that input and then convert it to some adjustment on that valve? There's some in between pilots and so that's what this course is all about. Okay, so here's, um, here's a quote from a previous summer student, just to maybe uh, wrap that section up on why this course is important. The student said uh, he, he or she had started her summer job on Monday. Um, they wrote this email to Dr. Marlon, and then within an hour of their job, they heard it was flood sensor, differential pressure sensor, feedback loop, set point, and this was programmed to use PID. Right? And this is not anyone done a co-op term. Anyone encountered feedback control or had to deal with any control issues. Yeah. So pretty much any of you that have had some experience, you've seen this. So if any one of you that have done your lab course, uh, you've done automatic titrations or pH controllers or temperature controllers in your lab courses, you've experienced control control loops already. Right? So this is where what we're going to be looking at. And then let's take one final slide here and put this in perspective. So up to now, we've learned heat transfer in 3A. We're going to be looking at reactive design with Dr. Mashkar in, in 3K. 
okay, but you may have taken the course already. For reactor design, you've looked at thermo, 3D, you've looked at fluid mechanics. All of these tell you how these units operate. Right? So you've learned about the heat exchanger, you've learned about that CSTR, you've learned about the fluid mechanics in the pump and the pipes and the valves, and you've learned about the flash drum and the vapor liquid fluid. What this course does is it pulls all of those together. You cannot do this course without those other pieces of information. We're going to go, like you did in 3E, you built models for heat exchangers. Dr. Adams worked, worked, walked you through various models. We're going to use those models now and integrate them with time. But we're also going to add the models for those valves. We're going to add the models for the sensors and the models for the feedback control systems. So we're simply taking all your knowledge you have already and adding an additional layer onto it so that you're capable of designing systems and working-based systems uh, in, in a way that's actually experienced. So you remember, this is the last level, is adding that process control layer. There's nothing more after that, really, that's, uh, that you can do to make it realistic. Everything you've learned so far is mostly realistic. We're just going to take it to that final step and complete the picture. Okay, so here's some fun terms we're going to learn about over the next few classes. Laplace transforms. So you had that back in math. We're going to use Laplace transforms fairly intensively over the next few weeks. The modeling that you did in 3D. We're going to learn things about what a PID controller is. We're going to learn what it means to tune a loop. So someone said I'm going to tune a process control loop. So I actually had a friend. Um, you, him, him, and his, uh, him and some buddies, they have a brewery in their basement, right? And they thought there's a PID control loop online, and it could not control the temperature. They needed it at a certain point, and what it was doing was just over control, over -compensate. And so he emailed me, like, can you help me tune this loop? Right? So what we did was we figured out what, what's going wrong, then some settings in their PID controller that wasn't quite right which was overcompensated. So they're now able to keep their beer brewing at a fairly constant temperature. So even if you get that from this course, that might be useful to you, right? <laughs> so uh, so those, are, those are important terms. We'll learn some other terms here. Symmetry, dead time, time delay, what robustness means. Uh, we'll learn about what an unstable loop is. Right? We don't like unstable loops. So we need to know what can cause a loop to go unstable and how to avoid that. And then near the end of this course, we'll learn about cascade control, feed forward control, and multi-input, multi-output. So those are some terms to look forward to um, in this course. Okay, so let's talk about some other administrative issues in the last 15 minutes. But up to this point, any, any questions before I move on to this topic? Any questions about questions? Okay, so let's take a look at, um, at some of the things regarding grading. Well, grading, my, my philosophy is, and you'll see this through all my courses, is I'm much more about your understanding of the concept. So demonstrating a good understanding of the concept. And particularly, not to be able to just redo examples from the textbook, but you have to be able to use the knowledge you've just learned and apply it to something you've never seen before. Right, so I'll, I'll, we'll learn some systematic methods to do that. How can you use some knowledge and apply it to some new examples and new context? You may need to think creatively sometimes about problems, some other solutions that are not always obvious. So we'll look at some of those as well. As, and as I said, yeah, seldom will you be able to take examples from a textbook and just repeat them. Right? So my midterms and final exams are not just repeats of examples that you've done in the textbook. Right? So there's no point in that. If all you can do is substitute numbers into an equation and solve for it, guaranteed you're going to be replaced by a computer. And I'm not saying that to be malicious, but seriously, if you cannot think about something, why is your employer hiring you? Someone who's hiring you is not paying you money to substitute numbers into an equation and solve. But there's no point in that. We have computers and spreadsheets that do that very accurately and very rapidly. So what are we hired for as engineers? We're hired to think about problems. Okay? We're hired to think about creative ways to make money for our employers. They're paying us and they want 
you to make more money for them. Right? That's really what it comes down to. When you're being hired by someone, they're paying you a salary and they're hoping that you make more money than your salary costs. So if your salary is $80,000 a year, $90,000 a year, you need to be making more than that for them. And then the only way you can do that is not by solving equations, but by actually thinking about things and applying your knowledge. So we're going to look at how to do that. And then low on that list is being numerically accurate. So in this course, uh, there's a lot of group work. Well, not, not as much as in some of my other courses. So this is actually probably the lowest amount of group work I ever had in a course. There's 20% on here. And that's on assignments and tutorials. You can do your assignments in groups of two. So either, you don't have to. You can do it by yourself or you can do it with one other person. Okay. Um, and if you do it with one other person, you hand in just one, one submission. You don't need two copies of the same thing. Okay, so that's, that's for assignments and tutorials. You can work together on those. In tutorials, in fact, you can work with more than two people. If you'd like to collaborate with several people in the room, feel free, but the assignment hand-in is in groups of two. Uh, if you hand in late, we'll deduct 30% per day, and we, I do have a two-day late policy, right? So you can hand in one assignment two days late, or you can hand in two assignments one day late each. Okay, but after you've used those two late day credits up, then we start deducting the third percent. And the solutions are typically posted within about two days. And once the solution is posted, there's no late day credits. So, um, and some days, I will, and I will say this ahead of time, <coughs> if it happens, I will sometimes post the solution to the assignment on the day that it's due. And usually I do that if it's um, just before a midterm or before the final exam. Right? Just because then I want you to be able to use those solutions. So I, but I'll let you know well in advance if that happens. There's no makeups for the assignments, and the assignments will count 10% of the course grade. There'll be about six of them. Um, now, when you do group assignments, you can go read through the slide later on, but essentially this says here, there's no point if the assignment has five questions that you do three of them and the other person does two, and then you staple them together and hand it in. Then you, neither of you have learned anything, right? So there's no point in doing that. What I suggest, as written over here, is that you work on it together, you exchange notes, and you actually learn from each other. That's the point of group. There's also weekly tests in this course. So every week you'll have an online computerized test. And why is that? Well, think of it this way. If you're training for a marathon, or if you do any sort of sport, or any hobby, maybe it might be ballet, it might be gymnastics, it might be dancing, whatever it is, you cannot, or running or jogging, you cannot train for that event the day before. So if you have a marathon race on Saturday, you cannot train on Thursday or Friday. What do you go do? Well, you train months in advance. Every day or every, twice, three times a week, you go out for a run, you practice, and you build up your stamina. University is the only place I know of where people cram in order to write an exam. But if you were taking a driving lesson for your G2 driving test, you don't go do one long cramming session of driving the day before you do your G2 driving test. But you go on several lessons and you space it out. You do every week you go for a lesson and you learn gradually and you build it up. So we're going to do the same thing in this course. And there's a whole lot of psychological literature on this, right? Who's taken Joe Kim's psychology course? Yeah, so you guys have seen this. He, he has these weekly tests as well. So there's no difference from that. And there's a lot of literature on it. It's called the testing effect. It's called the spacing effect. There's two different um, psychology, psychological issues going here. And both of them work in our favor. Spaced tests on a regular cycle will improve your performance. Okay? So we're going to have several of these, one every week. Um, as listed here, I'll post them on Wednesday morning. The test lasts one hour, so you have one hour to complete it, but any time between Wednesday and Friday you can do it. So you're going to have one hour free sometime between Wednesday and Friday, guaranteed. Find that hour whenever you choose, 
and then you log in and you do the test. Okay. There'll be a test, there'll be questions from the prior weeks, but usually it will cover the work you've just learned about the class. So it's a good opportunity for you to review as well. Those tests will count roughly 1% each, so I think there'll be about 10 or 11 of them by the end of the course, and those tests cumulatively count 9%. So it's very, very low stakes, but it's really there just to help you solidify and, and make sure you understand what is right. Okay. That test is done on your own, and you are allowed to use any materials and notes. Obviously, you're doing this at home, so your textbook is there right next to you, websites, whatever you want to use, but the code of honor is that you're actually doing this on your own. You're not texting your buddy and doing it together at the same time, right? And the computerized system has methods to detect that. So, so that's over there. Let's uh, talk about the rest of the grading. There's two midterms for this course, 12.5% each, one in February, one in March. And they're optional. If you don't show up for the midterm, that's quite okay. The grade for the midterm gets pushed to the final exam. But I will say this, I looked over the data for this course for the past three years. 80% of people that miss the midterm fail the final exam. So missing the midterm is really no benefit to it, um, but it is optional. I don't care about MSATs and all that abusive uh, way that it's being used by students. So it's optional. If you can show up, I figure you guys are old enough and mature enough to make these decisions for yourself, but I will just also put that data out there that a high failure probability in this thing. Final exam counts 48%, and an important note here is that if you get a grade of below 50% in the final exam, you need to fail the course. So, and that's never an issue. Never, I've never experienced that problem with, with people, but it is there as a way just to prevent um, trying to smooth the grades. Um, and then, as I said here earlier, any material is allowed in the final exam. You can bring any calculator, any notes, any papers, any prior solutions. You can feel free to bring. Uh, libraries and libraries of books for you, it's, that's quite okay. Now, tutorials. The first tutorial is today at 11.30. Um, so half of you uh, will have your tutorial on Monday, the other half on Friday. The first tutorial is today, and there is a small written test and a group-based test in that tutorial in today's class. It's just a, a pre-test just to get a baseline understanding of your knowledge. So, We'll get started with that. There's going to be 12 of them over the term. And they count for grades as well. The grading on the tutorials is simply class fail. So not showing up for the tutorial is obviously a fail. And any significant amount of work done in the tutorial is deemed a pass. But like if you're just sitting around in the tutorial and not working, that's also a fail. So it's not an attendance grade. So attending is, um, it works out kind of that way. But you can't just show up at the tutorial either and get your grade. Right? You're actually working with your group members during that time. And there will be a lot of interaction with myself and the TAs during the tutorial. Now, the tutorial, the way I've structured it, is also there to take the place of a project. There's no project in this course. You guys have enough other projects in 3G and all your other courses that you're taking. So what the tutorial is, is, is is essentially an extended project. We take what a project would have been, divide it up into 12 pieces, and you're doing incremental work on that over the 12 week period. Um, it's also a chance to work on the assignments and get any questions answered for myself and the TAs on your assignment. So it's also like an office hour period of time as well. But we'll learn some other skills that are not typically taught in process control. We're going to learn about instrumentation, about software, about control loops. Some of the skills that control engineers really need to succeed will be taught in that time. Does it work for mission per group? Yeah, so, yeah, per group, yeah. Okay, so here's some dates to take note of. 4th of February is the first midterm, 11th of March is the second midterm, and they're in the evenings. Please let me know right away. So you guys are going to have all your other course, courses this week where you're going to get dates from your other instructors. But I need to know about these clashes right away so that I can book them into dates officially. 
So if I don't hear any different by the end of the week, I'm going to change those dates. Um, just a heads up, but 3 I, uh, I think that's the uh, yeah, industrial, <coughs> industrial chemistry class, is um, Tuesday evening. Okay, so just uh, can you email that to me? So I'll, I'll, I'll likely bump it then to a Thursday evening. I was Thursday evening. Okay, so move that to 6th of February and 13th of March. We'll be in the tentative Merton dates. On Thursday, we have 4W. Okay, but um, 4W is a post requisite for this course, so that's, that's out of my control. Okay, so tentative dates of Thursdays. Okay, so any questions here in the last three, four minutes? Um, is it possible to go to either the Monday or Friday tutorial, or do you have to stick with your assigned tutorial? Okay, so for the question is, can you stick to the assigned tutorial or switch? So the room, this class is 120 students. The tutorials are in JHE A 101, and there's 60 seats in that room. So I can say yes, but it may not work out. So uh, like I don't want a whole bunch of like, uh, 30, 70 percent in balance. Uh, so I prefer you to stick with your data if you can have a sign, unless you really have a clash, in which case you can just do it with your data. Any other questions? Okay, so I don't get to pick the 8.30 time slot once again. Sorry about that, but let's uh, be 